Hello, U.S. Sister students. Welcome, welcome to another edition of Baker's Corner. Hope you are doing well. Uh, as you can see on our screen, we are moving into the end of our study of the presidency, other issues. So we're trying to unpack the big picture as best we can with, of course, a little bit of depth at the same time. So where did we leave off last time? We left off with the legacy of President Ronald Reagan, right? And Reagan, as we said before, his second term is, you know, going to be, you know, some people would argue a bit more challenging than his first term. And um, for a variety of different reasons, but those issues um, we'll look at a little bit later if we have time. But the question is, where do we go from Reagan into the modern era, right? And the answer is, we've got quite a bit of stuff that we still want to look at. You know, the administration of H.W. Bush, uh, President Bill Clinton. W. Bush, of course, the son of the um, the, the, the older Bush, um, of course, Barack Obama, and our current presidency with President Trump, okay? And so the question is, with the rise of 1988, we're going to look today with about 20, 25 minutes of our time at the domestic things of H.W. Bush, and then what we'll do in our next session, guys, we're going to transition our attention to looking at what a lot of historians would say was his kind of time of shining, right? The way that he kind of deals with the, um, uh, the foreign policy of the nation, you know, the first Gulf War, <clears throat> a lot of your parents guys probably remember that, um, has a lot to do with defining his time in office. And then of course, the question is, a lot of historians have it, we'll look at in the next session as we transition from that to the election in 1992 is, you know, man, his foreign policy was seen as fairly effective. He was pretty popular, you know, with how he managed the uh, the first Gulf War or Desert Storm. Why doesn't he win the election of 1992? Well, we're going to look at a little bit of that today, but most of that will be covered as we transition to, of course, the uh, the the earlier 90s and eventually the election of President Clinton. Okay, so what do we want to really understand <clears throat> about George H. W. w. Bush's one term in office. He was a one-term president. Keep in mind. So we've got one term in Carter, two terms in Reagan, one term in H. W. Two, 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 and then of course we'll see what happens with this fall's election with with the current one. Okay. But we want to focus our attention on the first two objectives. The last two we'll evaluate entering our next session. Okay. So we want to explain how does H.W. Bush 41, uh, Bush the Elder, Daddy Bush, if you want to call him that or whatever, how does he basically get America's attention quite a bit in the election of 1988? Okay, well, there's a little bit more to it than that, but we'll come back to it. And then the second thing is we want to identify and describe the major domestic policy initiatives that defined George H.W. Bush and his presidency. Okay, we're going to focus a little bit more on a few big things like how does he deal with the recession? Um, how does he basically deal with the increasing deficits that have been kind of moving into his presidency from the previous administration, the Reagan years? Um, and then one of the things that as an educator that I really think is important for us to have a grasp on is going to be his signing, and this was only about a year into his first only term, the Americans with Disabilities Act of 1990. All right, so we're going to spend probably the most time unpacking that. And a lot of people might be like, why are we going to do that? Well, first of all, it's a landmark piece of legislation. And a lot of you guys remember studying things like the Civil Rights Acts of 1964, some of those earlier Civil Rights Acts. There's a strong case to be made that this act is also going to be building upon some of those civil rights for, of course, people with disability. All right. So it's a very important thing that we'll look at with not just me giving you a little bit of background, but also a video. Okay. So where is W. But H.W.? Well, first of all, this is a guy that has a very expansive resume. Um, he fought in World War II. He was shot down in an airplane, if you didn't know that. Um, he went on. Of course, a lot of you remember he died just a couple of years ago. Uh, he and his a wife of over 70 years 
Um, <clears throat> Barbara Bush uh, went on to have a pretty good sized family. He was a house rep, he was head of the CIA. You know, he was VP, by the way, under President Reagan. I think I failed to mention that to you all in the last session. And so this guy has a lot of experience. And so with the degree of support by President Reagan, who keep in mind is still fairly popular in, in the eyes of, of a good number of Americans, basically he's gonna be the Republican candidate in 1988. And he's gonna be taking upon a Democratic candidate by the name of Michael Dukakis, okay? Um, I don't know if I would call this a landslide election, but HW is gonna gain a lot of the popular vote and of course the necessary you know, electoral college. What he does to get a lot of attention is, and you can see it on the slide, in many cases, I don't think he was probably as eloquent with his sound bites as Reagan was, you know, just me making a personal observation there, but he is gonna be very important with that whole read my lips, no, knew what taxes now guys you know as well as i do that is a bell ringer it sounds good but the the, the question we got to ask ourselves is what if what if it gets to a point where you consider the other extreme which is supporting tax increases for whatever reason right we'll get to that in a moment but it works and he does get elected to his only term in 1988. Um, like any president, he makes his inaugural address. And within about a year and some change, that's when he's going to be gaining some popularity with how he deals with Vietnam, not Vietnam, excuse me, uh, the first Gulf War. Um, the idea, guys, keep in mind of the Berlin Wall falling. We'll talk about that in our next session. All of those things are within about that first year to year and a half of HW's first and only term, okay? And so this pledge is gonna get a lot of attention amongst other things. And what's gonna happen, he's gonna have the opportunity to basically be faced with some pretty big things, okay? And this is the tip of the iceberg, but a lot of these things come back to some of the, the things that we'll look at next time with, for example, you know, when we have an end to our Cold War, last time we talked about all this money that the, um, the Reagan administration was advocating to spend on things like SDI and other areas of military. Well, the argument is when you have an end to the Cold War, is it really necessary to keep this large scale build up? And if the answer is no, then the argument's gonna be you start to downsize some of your military presence, which basically means things like, you know, maybe reducing troop numbers, you know, maybe uh, closing some military bases. Keep in mind, guys, a lot of us are like, well, that affects the military. Yes, but there's a lot of other jobs within those spheres. All right. And that's not just going to be, guys, remember, you know, a lot of you that have military, you know, uh, a little bit of military knowledge know that we don't just have bases now in the United States. You know, the development of us as a superpower over time has expanded our influence across, you know, Central America, South America, you know, parts of Europe, et cetera, you know, Asia as well. Um, and so what happens is that a lot of these things are going to start to go through transitions and it does have an effect on our economy. And that's going to be not the only reason why, but certainly something that leads to you know some 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 allusions to um, a recession. This is going to be arguably one of the biggest things that historians pinpoint as one of the biggest. I guess I'm going to call it the uh, kind of like a sword that's eventually going to be one of the bigger reasons why H.W. in 1992 is basically going to eventually lose that election to Clinton and then also the third party candidate Ross Perot. Okay, we'll talk about that a little bit more in our next session. Okay, but you know, the economy becomes the sole, I shouldn't say the sole issue, but certainly, you know, I think it was Clinton when he was running, um, he was a governor of Arkansas prior to being president, if you didn't know that, but he made some comment in one of his campaign rallies or whatever, one of his questions, he said, it's the economy, stupid. 
So recession does not usually bode well for people that are incumbents trying to be reelected in an election year, right? And in this case with HW, even though the popularity is somewhat there still with foreign policy, you know, you can't just throw foreign policy in there and say, okay, that's going to carry this election. In this case, it's something that has a arguably a, a bigger uh, thing. Okay. So something to keep in mind. Now, as far as, you know, things that presidents have to basically consider, you know, appointing positions, definitely you go back to Reagan and you look at, you know, his appointment of, I think it was three, maybe four Supreme Court justices, Anthony Kennedy, who just retired about a year, year and a half ago or whatever. Um, in the case of H.W. Bush, he's going um, to have to make these decisions too. And if you remember, just a little bit of background here, guys, a review. When Thurgood Marshall, right, the first African-American Supreme Court justice, is actually stepping down, then H.W. is going to have to make a decision about who do you replace him with? Well, the guy that he that he um, actually chose is going to be the gentleman that you see beside the cursor, uh, Clarence Thomas, who, by the way, is still on the court. Um, Thomas got a lot of attention, as we saw with our most recent appointee, with um, some some um, some personal things, um, the Dr. Anita Hill controversy, and uh, there was a a sexual allegation there. Now, eventually what you notice, guys, is that the Senate eventually votes and they do put Clarence Thomas on the bench, but it was a very, very close vote, right? Um, I think I remember when I was, let's see, I would have been about 15 or 16 back then. And of course, we have C-SPAN and other you know, cable news and things. And I remember watching the Senate literally voting on his appointment and it was within just a couple of votes of him being put on the bench, but he's still there, right? So again, that lifetime term will continue, okay? So what's another thing that is uh, WHW approaches re-election that, again, what do we say about 1988? Read my lips, no new taxes. That sounds good. But in the early 90s, the idea of these deficits getting larger and larger and larger and the federal debt increasing, okay? Kind of an interesting little statistic. Um, about the time that Reagan took office, you know, our federal debt, and when I say only, this is in comparison to now, is around $900 billion, okay? Between 1981 and 1989, that number has gone all the way from, from 900 billion to 2.7 trillion. So we've added three times the federal debt. Now, why do I bring this up? Well, if you're the, the H.W. Bush administration, you know, the issue comes up, well, how do we deal with this deficit? Do we increase taxes? Do we cut spending? Well, both of those issues are not easily addressable entirely because you've got sets of interest that drive both of those things. You know, tax increases are not really popular with people that have more conservative thinking regarding you know, how to expand the economy and things like that. Um, the other side of the coin, cutting especially programs like Medicare, Medicaid, um, food stamps, you know, Social Security, you know, anything that we associate guys with a lot of federal program spending that also is not going to be popular by especially people that support those sets of interests, all right, welfare programs, et cetera. And so this is kind of a conundrum. Now you might say, well, man, there's no way he would have went against that pledge of no taxes. In effect, there's a Democratic Congress, keep in mind H.W. Uh, is a Republican just like Reagan, okay? And eventually H.W. does make a decision to support a deficit reduction bill that eventually gets through Congress and eventually, of course, is going to become law. Okay. As you can see on the slide, that deficit reduction is going to inc include some degree of new taxes. So therefore, again, as you can imagine, guys, in 1992, you know, candidate Clinton and 
is going to use that as a very big tool or at least a, a campaign point to be able to point out some of the shortcomings of the H.W. Bush years. Okay, um, just a couple of quick things before we wrap up um, a little bit more detail with the, uh, the, the, uh, the, um, the Americans with Disabilities Act, um, but this is important. Um, this is the last time that actually our constitution has successfully been amended at the federal level. Okay, and so this 27th Amendment, a lot of students are like, well, you know, what in the world did they decide to do? They actually changed the system of Congress basically giving themselves basically what you might would call pay increases. And believe it or not, a little bit of history here, this was one of the original 12 amendments that they tried to get a, a passed that we today call the 10 Amendments of Bill of Rights. Two of them actually were not uh, put into that Bill of Rights eventually when they, um, when they actually voted successfully on the 10. This one, however, as you can see, makes its way into the Constitution, what was that, about 205 years later, 1992. Um, to give you a little bit of context here, I was a senior in civics class or government as we called it in, in my state of Ohio. And I remember my teacher, you know, came in, we had learned to start the year, there were 26 amendments, 26 being the one that learned the voting age. And it just so happened that my mom was very big on Mr. Baker watching the news. And so she informed me and we watched it, we talked about it a little bit. And I remember uh, being in class that next day and my teacher was like, so how many amendments are there? You know, and you could say, well, is that a trick question? Well, I don't think most teachers would say that's a trick question. He was trying to see how cognizant are we about things that are developing in our nation, et cetera. And so I said 27. And one of my classmates, I won't mention this person's specific name, basically said, <laughs> there were only 26. And I'm just sitting there trying to be humble, right? And Mr. Swan, our teacher, said, yep, Baker's right. That's the last amendment to be added to our Constitution. The question I have for all of you to think about, you know, think about your lives, you know, young people especially, what do you think is going to be that 28th? Right? The, the 27th could have been the ERA, but it was defeated as we looked at with a couple of our discussions on feminism. So what is going to be our 28th Amendment? You know, something, you know, that might deal with gun rights or something, right? Although the Second Amendment technically is already there, um, as we know, right to bear arms. Okay. And so that's an important amendment. Again, you might be wondering, how does it restrict congressional pay increases? Well, essentially, guys, for those of you who don't know much about this, let's say that you're a congressman or a woman or a senator, whoever's representing us in different branches of our, of our legislature. And let's say that they pass a pay increase, which is certainly within their rights to do. And let's say they pass it in 2018, or 17, excuse me, okay. And the question is, how does this amendment affect it? Well, the next Congress does not officially start until I think it's January 3rd of the, of the year after an election which would have been 2018. So if you're a congressman or woman or a senator and you don't get reelected to, to be inaugurated to another term, let's say in 2019 or wherever the next term would begin, then technically you don't get that pay increase. That's the way that amendment affects that issue. Okay, so anyway, kind of a neat little thing to keep you know, in the back of your mind if you're kind of wondering about the specifics, you can look at the Constitution. Last but not least, I would argue one of the most overlooked things that President Bush signs into law is definitely going to be, as you can see, 1990, this Americans with Disabilities Act. Okay. Now, we're going to stop here for just the moment because I want to show you a quick video that kind of uh, highlights this a little bit more. And then we'll end our discussion on domestic things and we'll set up what we're going to do next time. Okay. But I want you to think about how would this act, before we watch the video and after we unpack it a little bit, how would this act be important 
to people that even aren't affected directly by disability, right? So in other words, you, you know, somebody who doesn't have, let's say, like um, the uh, autism or something like that, you know, why would you, or why should we as a society care? Again, think back to what I said a moment ago about the issue of civil rights. And we'll come back to this here in just a second. This historic act is the world's first comprehensive declaration of equality for people with disabilities. The first. I now lift my pen to sign this Americans with Disability Act and say, let the shameful wall of exclusion finally come tumbling down. God bless you all. I really believe that people with disabilities are the greatest untapped resource in this country today. The ADA has given us the right to travel the sidewalks and streetscapes of our country. The ADA was the critical linchpin of uh, you know changing things, and, and now it's an ongoing process of using it to try to create these kinds of changes. ADA's done this fantastic things with people that are blind, people in wheelchairs, getting up public transportation. <laughs> is in transportation for me being able to travel around the country independently in a power wheelchair to just about any city in the country is definitely a factor of the ADA people with disabilities are out and about and one of the reasons they're out and about is because the ADA required that um, transportation providers make their services make their transportation accessible no one would have installed curb cuts if it weren't for people with disabilities. Now everyone uses them. The transportation systems are getting more and more comfortable, you know, working with people with disabilities. And it's just, you know, I've just seen huge changes in that area. Because it doesn't do uh, a person with a disability much good if they can apply for a job and get the job if they can't actually get to work. more technology today, everything from not only uh, desktop electronic magnifiers, but we now have pocket magnifiers that are electronic and allow us to be mobile with those types of uh, magnification devices. Where um, some of the assistive technology could be really helpful is with some of the uh, nonverbal people with autism. Some of these people do have a good brain in there. They can learn to type independently. Now many movie theaters have open captions. So I can go to a movie on opening day just like uh, hearing individuals can. When I go to a hotel, I have a visible fire alarm if there were to be a fire. They have equipment there that makes it accessible for me. Uh, like alarm clocks that vibrate, TTYs. You know, I know that people with disabilities want to go to work. You know, they want to feel the pride of earning a paycheck. And they have talents that uh, they can contribute. Particularly for the blind community, we experience about a 70% unemployment rate when compared to the rest of society. If people want a new job, uh, they can get an interpreter for the interview and be able to secure that job. So I think the Americans with Disabilities Act has impacted deaf people's lives in a variety of ways. The ADA Amendments Act is really about bringing down barriers and providing people with disabilities uh, not only access to accommodations and public buildings and stuff, but access to opportunities. I think the biggest struggle with people dealing with mental health issues is um, is to have the public acknowledge uh, that, that they are discriminated against, uh, that it is a disability and they do face discrimination. When people that have a hidden disability, uh, they're going to need accommodations like being away from fluorescent lights, have a quiet place to work. Those are two really important accommodations, and those are usually easy to do. We have so many uh, veterans who have been wounded in combat uh, now coming home and are going to need the, the proper support so that they can enter the workforce. <laughs> 
be my hope that people use the act to continue to achieve the basic rights that they're entitled to, that everybody has and that everybody wants. And the younger generation definitely needs to know what their rights are, but also to take that responsibility of leading the charge now and moving this forward. And it's really only now, 20 years after the ADA, that people have a full complement of resources. Disability in general is an equal opportunity condition. And that the longer we live, the older we get, each one of us has the opportunity to acquire a disability. I may be the, uh, uh, the first quadriplegic to serve in the United States Congress, but I most certainly won't be the last. ADA has certainly provided uh, a great vehicle and a, a pathway for people with disabilities to succeed. Hopefully in the next 10 to 20 years, we'll make that much more progress. <laughs> So, guys, what did you think about what you saw with that Americans with Disabilities Act? There's a lot to think there. There's a lot to unpack. Um, as an educator, I'm just finishing my 23rd year of teaching. And just a quick story on this. And I remember, you know, going through um, teacher preparation and so forth. And we had a wonderful professor. Um, and she actually had a, a background in, in special education. Um, and I remember one day, you know, we were going through some, some, some discussion on it and she said, well, you know, I'm going to, you know, give you kind of like a, a challenge. And so she said, you got 10 minutes to convert your classroom into a classroom that basically, um, makes it accessible for people with disability. Okay. And so there was probably about 20 of us in this class or whatever, and this professor left. And so we brainstormed. And so we're like, well, we got to make sure the desks are in a certain number of feet apart, you know, thinking, okay, you know, people with, you know, wheelchairs, 10 minutes rolls around. And the professor came back to our classroom and she basically walked through the door. She wasn't in a wheelchair and we were trying to, to show her where her desk was and she wasn't basically responding. Um, and basically what we learned was that she was basically portraying uh, someone of hearing loss. Okay. And, you know, I think it's interesting, you know, what I learned from that was that, you know, we got to understand the whole realm of disability, right. And it's different forms. And I remember, you know, um, you know, the lady in the video, one thing that really stood out to me and I'll end with this was she said, you know, uh, disability is an equal opportunity condition right and i'm sure that most of you all have or hopefully not but anyway some of you all have you know met people that you know they had a heart condition that made it to where they had actually you know park in a handicapped spot right or you know uh, maybe you had a, a family member or someone you knew that actually had hearing loss okay those are two examples of many that obviously are important okay so i want you to think as we transition to next week in our, in our next lesson, you've got some of these things that have made it difficult for George H.W. Bush to be able to be reelected, the economy, you know, going against his no tax pledge. But we haven't really talked extensively about his role with foreign policy. I want you to ponder that. I want you all to have a great rest of your week. Um, you know, feel free to contact me if you have any questions. And as always, guys, stay safe, and I will look forward to seeing you all sooner um, rather than later. But feel free to uh, reach out if you need anything, and I hope you all have a good one. Thanks. Bye.